It's a huge pleasure to, to welcome Padma Shri Gail Sampath, who is somebody I met first at a meeting at the Open University a number of years ago now. Um, and his work I've always appreciated in the kind of science technology field. Um, she has been, well still is, a research fellow at the United Nations University in Maastricht and has been lecturing at the Open University and is now a visiting fellow there. So connects up with the group um, involving Joe Chataway and Ray Pinsky and others whom we've also heard from as part of this manifesto seminar series. So that's a nice connection. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you here to speak in what I think will probably be the last of these background steps manifesto seminars um, leading up to the process that's about to happen, which is actually the writing of this manifesto. But I hope that it will be an opportunity to, again, sort of get involved in a process and that there might be other opportunities to engage later. But um, we were particularly interested in, in engaging with the work you've been doing around intellectual property and perspectives on that in a global and a development context. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, um, speak for half an hour, 40 minutes or so, sure. and then we'll have some discussion through till 2 o'clock and beyond if we, if we want to. Okay. Good. So, uh, thank you very much, Melissa, and uh, thank you, Adrian and Harriet and everybody else uh, for inviting me. And um, can I uh, sit on the? Can I sit on the I think it's. I can see. Oh, you have to unlock it. You know, you can you can just touch the screen to make this move on. I can stand and touch the screen if you want to, I'm or sure you can do it with page down on the. Here you've got this as an, an option, or you can use the, the mouse, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, but what you mustn't do is touch the screen, just point, because that will bring the next slide up. Oh, you mean I can only touch the screen here? Yeah. Here. Or here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Exactly. okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Um, well, I mean, as Melissa said, I'm going to be talking about some of my work on, uh, on IPRs, knowledge and innovation in, uh, in developing countries, which uh, I can learn development, just generally. Um, I just want to start with a brief, brief background of the, of the positive and negative impacts of IPRs um, that we constantly hear in the literature on this topic. Um, I'm just assuming that all of you know everything that I'm saying. So if that's not the case, just stop me, then I'll explain a bit more. Um, because I really want to cover a lot of ground in 30 minutes. So, so um, some of the direct positive impacts is that, I mean, is, is said that IPRs is obviously an uh, incentive for firms and individuals to engage in innovation. So it's an innovation driver. It creates markets for technology for small firms, especially new technologies like biotech, where small firms can come up, patent uh, their uh, inventions and use that as sort of uh, strategic assets and uh, joint ventures and licensing agreements and joint R&D contracts. Uh, the indirect positive effects is that uh, I think in, in countries where IPRs is not able to induce all of this, it's able to at least induce technology transfer and technology flows. So by, uh, by recognizing IPRs and, and enabling patent reforms in, uh, in, in developing countries, there's going to be a better regulatory regime for technology transfer and technology flows, and there's going to be a higher probability of foreign direct investment, and this could eventually induce increased investment by firms based in the north or developed countries into research priorities of those developing countries that identify and protect intellectual property rights. Um, the same, I mean, there's, there's also a wide variety of literature that covers the negative impacts and um, amongst the direct negative impacts, which they are, these are, I mean, amongst those that receive maximum attention. One of the things is that um, when you have broad patterns on initial in inventions, say in biotech and in, in newer technologies like systems biology and genomics, 
their transaction costs for follow-on innovation because the follow-on innovator have to license all these different uh, patents uh, and they have uh, for them to conduct research. There are patent tickets and hold up of R&D through infringement cases, which is the case in, uh, in uh, the semiconductor industry. Then uh, the argument is that um, IPRs causes leads to too much R&D and we're anticipating races and it's not really socially optimal. And uh, another negative direct impact that's often mentioned in the literature is that it leads to defensive patenting. Too many firms tend to patent everything that comes their way in the hope that it will be something useful in the future. And there is another set of direct um, negative impacts, but which is relevant to developing countries. One is that IPRs prevents uh, reverse engineering of the kind that was available for developing countries to do before the TRIPS agreement. So it's actually against catch up and it prevents countries from actually being uh, from actually being able to develop innovation capacity. Uh, IPRs makes access to technologies very difficult. This is especially a case in the case of, uh, this is especially a, a, an argument in the case of health research and biomedical technologies. Um, I don't know if all of you are familiar, familiar with uh, the uh, medical anti-commons, right? Okay, so um, the medical anti-commons is, is, uh, is where in, in, the, in biomedical research where you have too many intellectual property rights, it creates the opposite of what, uh, what is the attribute of a commons resource. It creates the anti-commons. So all, uh, all follow-on inventions are blocked by broad innovations, so broad uh, patents on, on initial innovations. Then there's the problem of royalty stacking, which means that if I'm a downstream innovator, I have to, to negotiate license with a series of upstream innovators, and each one of the licenses comes with the royalty fees. And as a downstream innovator, I have the problem of royalty stacking. I have to pay so much royalty to all the upstream innovators to be able to just engage in innovation, which is itself uncertain. I'm not sure if it's going to result in something, okay? And then there's the problem of uh, patent tickets. That's also the issue of, uh, of biomedical innovation. So that's, that's, the, that's the chief argument which has been made and it has, uh, there has been evidence presented from different countries on the environmental innovation. Then another negative direct effect in developing countries is that in some specific sectors it leads to public good problems because it leads to higher prices in the case of seeds, drugs, vaccines and so on. IPRs in agriculture, IPRs in agriculture biotech, IPRs in the health sector. And the last um, argument that's usually made is that IPRs not only hinder access to technologies, they also make access to knowledge per se difficult because IPRs on databases, sui generis systems on databases, sui generis systems that protect particular kinds of educational materials, they make it difficult for universities and academic institutions in developing countries to access and make these available. This prevents formation of human capital and it also prevents actually interactive learning that's important for building innovation capacity. And what is generally accepted is of course that all negative impacts worsen when you have low quality patents. By this I mean patents where novelty is not clearly established, <coughs> you have broad patents where you give patents on incremental innovations as opposed to, to really uh, serious novel innovations. Um, now I come to identifying some of the problems with the discourse. Now, uh, while all this is well and said at a broad and general level, there are uh, several problems if you want to engage really more seriously and go deeper into it. One of the main problems is in choosing a compar comparable theoretical frame. Now, most of the economic analysis of the TRIPS agreement, which present the arguments that I gave before, they focus on optimal design of intellectual property regimes and they balance consumer lo losses with firm profits, okay? This is the standard framework in which they analyze. And within this, the main assumption